mummies. We all know what those are, right? The preserved remnants of those who have been dead for hundreds or thousands of years, who in popular culture awaken to curse anyone who dares enter their tombs. Maybe you've dressed up as one for Halloween by covering yourself in toilet paper? Mummification has been practiced all around the world, from Egypt to Western South America to Japan, and they can tell us a lot about how people lived in these ancient times. However, the mummies of ancient Egypt are still shrouded in mystery, and people ask many questions about them. Like, how were they mummified? Why were they mummified? What ancient secrets do they hold? Can I eat them? Today, let's dive into the ancient and early modern history of Egyptian mummies, and unravel the screwy geopolitics that led to people so eagerly digging them out of their tombs. Look, Halloween just happened to align perfectly with my upload schedule, so I just want to make something, okay? Egypt has, in one way or another, held the attention of different peoples all around them since ancient times. Egypt is, of course, a really old country. That should be blindingly obvious. In fact, Egypt is so old that the study of ancient Egypt has almost as long an historical history as Egypt itself. The title of the first Egyptologist is often attributed to a man by the name of Chemoset in the 13th century BC, an Egyptologist who is a literal ancient Egyptian himself. Chemoset restored statues and monuments of earlier pharaohs and nobles, namely a statue of Prince Kawab, one of the sons of Khufu, of Great Pyramid fame, who, keep in mind, lived over 1300 years prior. Strabo, Herodotus, and Diodorus Siculus all wrote detailed accounts of ancient Egyptian history during the Greco-Roman periods, and later on, medieval explorers from both Europe and the Arab world did much the same. At around this time, however, a bit of a craze started to appear within Europe, not necessarily for Egypt itself, but for their mummies. But why did the Egyptians mummify their dead in the first place? In Egyptian belief, death wasn't the end, but a continuation of the cycle. However, in order to successfully continue on into the afterlife, the Ba, personality, and the Ka, spirit, as in Ka, misspelled, plus Anubis, had to be able to reunite with the body. Which of course meant that the body still needed to be recognizable. Now, how were mummies made? I'll summarize this fairly quickly, but to follow the Egyptian recipe, first, you'll need a body. Preferably a dead one. Please, for the love of the gods, use a dead one. I actually had one we could use, but he got a bit... overripe, so we'll just go to the animations instead. First, you're going to want to make an incision in the lower abdomen, but make sure to preserve the lungs, stomach, liver, and intestines. But make sure to leave the heart in the body, it really ties the soul together. The brain you'll just want to remove and throw away, which was done by jamming a spike up the nose and then inserting a hook to make mashed brains before being poured out. This whole process was known as excerebration. So the next time you're complaining about getting a COVID test, next you'll want to rinse the chest cavity out with palm wine and stuff it up for the next step, which was drying it out in a crap ton of natron salt for the next 40 or so days. Now once this process is done, the body should have lost most of its water content, which means it should be a lot more shoveled up and weigh a lot less, but also be a lot more inhospitable to bacteria. Now it's not exactly the best smelling thing this side of the Nile, so you want to cover it in perfumed oils, and then cover it in a layer of sticky resin. This resin also has the effect of keeping the linen straps on there. I'd recommend doing two or three layers of the resin and linen. Make sure to put a few prayers and amulets in there to spiritual taste, and ta-da! Pharaoh Salami the First. Now all you need to do is put in several layered coffins and put it underground to marinate for several thousand years. Then have someone dig it up a few thousand years later, crush it up into medicines, and have them wonder just why their descendants think they're so insufferably weird. Mumia was a type of bitumen, or asphalt, used in Islamic and ancient Greek medicine. This term, as well as the English word mummy, both likely derive from the Persian word for wax, mum. However, this term also referred to a similar substance used to coat Egyptian mummies during the mummification process since the 12th dynasty. Unsurprisingly, in Europe, these two terms were often confused enough to be further misinterpreted and mistranslated to imply it was the mummies themselves that had medicinal properties. And it was a fairly popular remedy, too. When mummia first got popular, healers often used a waxy mix of embalming fluid and bodily fluids as medicinal. 11th century Persian polymath Ibn Sina recommended mummia for everything from broken bones to concussions and nausea. 
And starting around the 16th century, you could find powdered mummies at most European apothecaries. But as mummy medicine got more popular, healers would use the entire corpse and grind it up into a powder they'd mix into wine. Maybe they'd add some cinnamon for flavor. And it seems buck wild, but back then this made sense considering how people understood medicine. Some of the cutting edge doctors were just figuring out basic anatomy, like the fact that the heart pumped blood. But lots of European healers still thought that diseases had supernatural causes, so their remedies often had supernatural justifications. Like if you were taking the mummified remains of a strong young soldier, you'd get strong and fit yourself. All the better if the man died a violent death and left an otherwise healthy corpse. Starting around the end of the 16th century, folks were starting to get yucked out by mummy medicine. Plus, thanks to trade bans on human remains, scholars got wise to the fact that apothecaries were selling modern corpses just marketed as mummies. So fast forward and the last mention of this kind of remedy in medicine was in a 1905 German pharmacy book. But Europe's fascination, or obsession, exploitation of Egypt was still going strong. Oh cool, thanks Patrick Kelly from your eponymously named Medical History Channel, which you should check out. Mummy brown even became a popular color of paint, used liberally for instance in Ma Tantuali's interior of a kitchen. However, mummy brown eventually started to fall out of use by the 19th century, presumably once artists became more aware of what exactly it was made of. But indeed, Europe's obsessploitation of Egypt was only just starting. By the 19th century, while mummies were gradually no longer being ground up into medicine or pigments, Europeans were still no less obsessed with the bodies of these long dead rulers. As a matter of fact, rich and powerful people across Europe became virtually obsessed with ancient Egypt around this time. One such powerful person in particular was Napoleon. Starting in July 1798, Napoleon led an invasion of Egypt to cut off British supply routes to and from India. Invading Egypt in the summer, because evidently this guy's genius in military planning didn't quite extend to the fact that Egypt gets hot in the summer. I mean, there were also tactical reasons for not wanting to wait too long, but just, just let me have the joke. While the army was marching down to battle against the Mamluk armies in Cairo, though, the nearly 200 scientists that had also been brought along the voyage from France stayed behind on the northern coastal town of Rashid, also known as Rosetta, where they found a stone. The campaign ended up getting completely kerplunked by 1801, with Napoleon slipping his way back to France, but it was successful in starting what we would know as modern Egyptology. Back in Europe, mummy unwrappings became a common event in private homes and later on in theaters. People like Thomas Pettigrew even became famous for their knowledge of ancient Egyptian mummies. The Duke of Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, no not that one, even requested Pettigrew have him mummified, and upon his death aged 84, was mummified and buried in a sarcophagus from the Ptolemaic period, which he had acquired allegedly for the British Museum. Amid the surge of Egyptology in the 19th and early 20th centuries, Egyptians themselves were generally discouraged from studying their own history, as Egyptology became much more of a European venture, the locals often being relegated to doing the heavy lifting, while scientists from Britain, France, Germany, Italy, the United States, and several others did the actual studying and did so through what some might call a Eurocentric perspective. It's ancient Egyptian history, politics, and beliefs as looked at through a European lens. The idea of an eternal Egypt became popular among the remaining royal families of Europe, as if to show the importance of a strong, powerful ruling elite in maintaining Egypt's long-lasting stability. Even nowadays, nearly a century after the end of colonial rule, the eternal Egypt ruled by a strong ruling caste is an idea cemented not just in non-Egyptian minds, but has also been used as if to imply that the modern regimes ruling Egypt are but merely a continuation of what has been for over 5,000 years. Egyptian mummies have become a symbol of the age and longevity of Egyptian civilization, and the sense of mystery behind their enigmatic practices. Get away. Furthermore, they've become one of the go-to symbols of ancient Egypt in the West, making their way into pop culture as one of the generic Halloween monsters, albeit as basically zombies covered in toilet paper. Alright, cool. Think we're good? Yeah. I think that's a wrap.